Butterfly people, Trek alien evolution and surviving space. Oh my. We're all in this together after all. Welcome back to BioTrekkie with the Admiral. Woo! Woo! <laughs> I'm Mohammed Noor. I'm a biology professor at Duke University, and I'm an occasional science consultant for the Star Trek universe. And I'm Jane Brooke. I played Admiral Katrina Cornwell in the first two episodes, um, two episodes, two <laughs> seasons of Star Trek Discovery. And I'm so happy to be back here with my friend Mohammed talking about the fourth season and all the biology and everything. Yay, yay, yay. Oh, man. So, so exciting. <laughs> Great to be back. Yeah, it is good to be back. So, um, Mohammed, let's dive right in. We already know the structure that we had last year where... Uh, I'm wondering, in the first two episodes of season four, I'm wondering what jumped out at you, biologically speaking? What, like, three things? Great question. So, actually, I have three focal things, and then I'm going to do a bonus fourth one that I'm not going to go into. So, the first one, this comes from the first episode, the, the butterfly people. I think they were called the Al Shane. There's a lot that I'd like to unpack with them in terms of their biology. I thought they were very interesting and creative. Uh, second, in both the first episode and the second episode, we saw some familiar Trek aliens, and some of them don't look exactly like they did in earlier Star Trek series. This is something that's come from a couple of different Star Trek series. So I want to unpack that a little bit and talk about the pace of evolution. And the third one, I want to talk about effects of sudden exposure to space. This isn't something I knew a lot about, but it was fun reading about that given the scene in that first episode. Um, bonus one that I'm not going to go into this time was magneto reception which came up very explicitly in the episode the reason i can go into is we talked about it actually in our last set of biotrick with the admiral videos so if you see the our episode on the sea locusts on season three episode eight we talked about it there in the context of earth sea turtles and also my good friend dr mike wong has an episode of his podcast called strange new worlds that actually goes into that in a lot of depth so i'll just leave that i'll just leave that alone <laughs> okay great well i'm excited because of course, uh, the first episode opened with those really cool butterfly people. So in my notes, I wrote first, Mohammed, butterfly people. So tell us more about that. Yeah, so there's a lot to unpack there. It's funny. Now, how light must they be, right? <laughs> because <laughs> they're, they're, those, those are big individuals. And they don't have gigantic, like, you know, gigantic wings. They have wings that are a little bit bigger than their body size. So... It was interesting to just speculate, like, you know, how is it that they're actually able to fly? And, and when we think about other animals that are presently on Earth, how, how big is the largest animal that can fly? So I did a little bit of searching online. So the heaviest animal today that can fly is apparently the great bustard. Oh, <laughs> it's a bird. <laughs> it's about 15 kilograms or 35 pounds. They're a good bit. Those aliens are a good bit heavier than that. So that's interesting. Um, if you go back historically, there are some pterosaur dinosaurs that weighed maybe as much as 200 kilograms, which that might be actually significantly larger than the than the Al Shane aliens. But they also had wingspans that were like larger than small airplane wingspans. Wow. <laughs> so th there's there's a lot of issues there just in the context of like the, the weight and the, the amount of power that have to be generated, or not power, but the amount of lift that have to be generated by the wings as they're flapping, the energetic costs of that. It would be tough <laughs> to be that size and have wings that size to fly. I'm not saying it's necessarily impossible, but it, it, it would it would definitely be tough. So you know, it's interesting having a biologist look at those butterfly people because, of course, as a viewer, I'm just like, I totally go with it. I'm like, cool, those are beautiful butterfly people. But now that you mention it, I would never see it the same way again because, of course, when you look at a moth or you look at a butterfly, their bodies are tiny, tiny little tiny little you know pencil yeah. little bodies with yeah. these comparatively huge wings yeah. so that is interesting that's a whole different uh whole different ball game their wings were really interesting to do you see how they kind of just came together and assembled that was fascinating right, right. <laughs> it wasn't clear what was coming together so we saw in the very opening scene of that we saw like a little pupil case opening up and something flying out so was it calling in friends or, <laughs> or, or yeah I'm i don't sure. know i don't know they also mentioned, i was just looking at the art of it and it was just yeah. really pretty yeah oh it was beautiful 
Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. That, that was interesting. The other thing they mentioned that they had all these technological advances because they mentioned something to Michael Burnham about how you're here for our technology. I was wondering like, what is their technology? But maybe it has something to do with that. Maybe they're actually not biological, but they're actually in some way technological. I, I, I don't know. That was just an interesting comment that they made there. There, there was the, the wording they used was technological bounty. So well, well clearly, because they did, these wings did appear and they were able, although uh, they couldn't navigate, of course, without yeah. um, the help of Boken. Yeah. The related really- thing to that, which I thought was interesting, was how it assembled it. So if it was, this is something I, I couldn't think of a good Earth example for this. Is there an Earth species that can actually have a removable part that gets reacquired easily? That was very interesting. So I, I was trying to find stuff, like, and I could find examples that are kind of trivial, like you know, you can cut, say, like a fungal mycelium or something like that, and it can reconnect. But it's not, it's not intentional. It's not a left. big organism like no, that. No, it's, yeah. it's basically yeah. healing as opposed to actually like reconnecting. But generally speaking, like if if for most species on Earth, once you're severed, you're like now you're like separate. You may be right. clonally the same thing. You might be genetically the same thing, but you're actually separate. You can't just fuse back in right, <laughs> so right. easily with yeah. the other person so that was an interesting because i never really thought about that question before and just seeing that there was like oh interesting it would be neat if there were species that could disassemble and reassemble like they had like a removable part that could go off and do something like a drone <laughs> right it makes me think like of the writer's room like are they because of course they've got biologists in there like or are they just um being creative like they've got their imaginations going and, and, you know, and they're just saying somehow this is working, you know, yeah. but anyway, it's cool. Yeah. Um, well, how about the familiar going to, to the familiar aliens that we have seen before yeah. and we are seeing again, but they were a little different. I'm intrigued that what, what clicked in your brain mm-hmm. is okay. After 900, mm-hmm. you know, nearly a thousand years, mm-hmm. these familiar aliens have, mm-hmm also evolved um, yeah. so tell me what you yeah what was prompted well, it's, in your mind it's interesting because i'm not sure how much they've evolved so one example that people used a lot on if you look in social media this is actually even prior to the first episode airing there was the scene with the seemingly ferengi guy the, the captain there with the the big head mm-hmm. and they were saying oh my gosh he doesn't look the same like you know which you know as you i'm sure remember this was true for the klingons and in yeah. every iteration of Star Trek right, right. things like that um it's interesting that people harped on that. So first of all, like yeah, it's been 900 years, it's true. There could be some evolution that happens then. Honestly, probably not a ton. I mean, what would that be like? Maybe 40 generations. I mean, that would be like, you know, taking going the other direction of you saying like, would somebody from the Crusades look different today? Oh, that's true. We're taller. Yeah, we are taller. That's, that's, I'm glad yeah, you said that. We are taller. That is true. Yeah. That, that's not probably genetic. That's probably just based that's on- That's nutrition. Much, exactly. It's probably that's just nutrition. much better diet. Yeah. So my guess when we see something like, uh, if, if you know, obviously if, if it were real, which maybe it is, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> if it were real, my guess would be what we're seeing isn't so much evolution as unsampled geographic variation. So for example, let's say that you sampled three humans today and got them all from you know Germany, you know, and then 900 years you sample somebody and they weren't from Germany, they were from you know Brazil or they're from Botswana or they're from Japan. They look, look a look really little different. different. Oh, right? <laughs> that's a great explanation. I think that's more likely what it is. And, you know, yes, we saw several Ferengi in the past, but a lot of them were related. I mean, we have Quark and Ram and Nog. I mean, they're all like relative moogies. This, they're all, yeah, they're all one relatives. family. And look how different people look on Earth. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I think that answer satisfies the people who are very, very attached to the original shows. Yeah. And um, and and it justifies the new look oh that's great absolutely there also could have been some events of hybridization maybe that person is not 100 percent. it's not like he had labels of ferengi it could be like he's part ferengi and part some other species we don't know of or something like that so yeah that it was interesting seeing how much you know discussion there was over that and i was i just thought like whatever it's probably just geographic variation i doubt it's truly evolution it's not necessarily that like oh they're got more ripples and exactly in these spots on their ears like eh, eh, it could happen yeah it doesn't ever bo- it doesn't really bother me because i i um i just love to see what the makeup artists and the designers and totally. the writers like i i just like seeing what they imaginatively come up well in this case it would be the you know makeup designer and people like that but uh-huh. um mm-hmm. i just like to see what they come up with so yeah, we might come back on, on makeup when we talked about uh, the president too later on, President Rillock. <laughs> oh, okay, yes, we'll talk about that. Um, 
So this is very interesting and you had to study up on it, but the effects of sudden exposure to space. Yeah. So this is not something I knew about at all because it's not an evolutionary thing or a genetics thing at all. Yeah. You can imagine. <laughs> so I read a, a good bit online about this and um, it's interesting that, you know, in sci-fi, often you have somebody going to space and like they blow up or they just immediately freeze solid or something like that. Apparently, and I found multiple good sources about this, like not just, you know, random Joe's blog or something. Okay. <laughs> no offense yeah. to random Joe. <laughs> yeah. Interestingly, like exposure to space in terms of just the cold, we'll come back to other parts. In terms of just the cold, it's actually, yes, it's very, 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 very cold. But the effect on humans is a lot slower than you would think. The reason for that being is because there's no air molecules hitting you. Basically, you're not touching anything in space. By definition, it's called space, right? The, the only way you lose heat is through radiation. You're not losing it by any sort of conduction or anything like that. So it would be cold, but it wouldn't be as insane as, let's say, the same temperature uh, or even on close Earth. to the same temperature on Earth, yeah. exactly, where you have an atmosphere or you're touching something like that. So that's not so extreme. Um, there are, of course, many, many other issues. Yeah. <laughs> One of the biggest ones is the vacuum aspect, right? So a very likely thing to happen right then is, you know, the air is the air in your lungs or inside of you is just going to very suddenly blow up. So in theory, you could you, you could bust a lung almost immediately unless you just immediately oh, exhale really Ex fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. Yeah. Any any liquids on you could, would probably boil, possibly even just slightly below the skin surface would probably start to boil. So that's obviously really bad. But you probably could survive that for a few seconds, which Michael did. So I mean, that was not. So you, anybody who may have said like, "Oh, that would never happen," like, eh, that part's not necessarily problematic. At least at least based on the things I was reading, it like you could survive a couple of seconds there. Now. Okay. One big issue, which <laughs> doesn't come up there at all, is what are the long-term effects? Because not only are you in space, but you're also now exposed to like straight-up cosmic rays. You know, that does hardcore radiation. Uh, you know, you've got the cosmic rays, you got you know UV, A, B, and C. You know, now I don't know how close they were to a sun or something like that, but there right. still would be the cosmic rays going through. That, that those are really bad. It's really bad ionizing radiation going through you. There could be effects there were a like, long-term oh, effect yeah exactly effects well you know, then you you've given them an idea you know they'll have to solve that if that comes up in the future yeah exactly fortunately they have transporters so they can just reintegrate it i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah. dr culver will, culver will figure that one out he yeah. will figure he'll it out fix he can it. figure out anything yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he'll he'll fix whatever problem yeah totally totally but those are my three things and then they, they've certainly had plenty of radiation exposure in various uh yeah. iterations of star trek and they always seem to find ways to fix the radiation exposure so I assume this would this would be all right too, right. <laughs> at least by whatever means they're using there in the year thirty two hundred. Yeah. Oh, yeah. very good. Very but those good. are those are my three things. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the production side. I I mean I love it like more and more each year. So I um, what I love about this the you know the beginning of this um, fourth series fourth year I love the pace. Mm -hmm. I love the confidence of the pace. Mm -hmm. I love the philosophical, um, the slower and more philosophical. It's or seemingly maybe you can just absorb it more easily when the pace slows down a bit. But, um, you know, when I look at my notes from watching the first one, I, I, you know, I circled, I love the phil philosophical pace. I love the way that Saru and Doug is doing such a great job just as Doug, but they, um, they've sort of made him the wise elder mm -hmm. and he delivers with such kind of calm wisdom, mm -hmm. these great universal lines. Like mm -hmm. in the beginning when he, that theme of communion, that theme of home Love that. You know, having a wider interconnected meaning. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, they're introducing. And then later in the episode, um, when you're on Quajon, again, the theme of the oneness of it all, you know, and in that case, it's the oneness of, of what we would call the flora, the fauna, the, you know, the creatures, the, um, and it reminded me of, you know, St. Francis of Assisi, you know, brother, son, sister moon. I think that's the quote. I can't remember, but the, the one, I was really struck by the that theme of the oneness of it all, which of course reminds me of how with what we are all facing on earth with pandemic and environmental crisis, you can't, you can't approach these huge 
things like these anomalies that they're mm -hmm. facing, mm -hmm. you can't approach it as if you have a border, you know, the, the environmental crisis and the pandemic doesn't stop at the border of France or the border of, you know, uh, so I like that they're bringing in these themes that are, um, that we can relate to in our own lives. And then in the second episode, the theme kind of was a great compliment to the oneness of it all. Because in the second episode, several characters peppered very subtly and beautifully throughout the show talked about um, from the beginning, everybody grieves in their own way. You know, each person is an individual and they will book will grieve as book grieves and in his own timing. But that was not the only reference to there was um, I wrote it down, but they, I, I don't know if I can find it in my notes, but there were several references to people. There was him. He had to grieve it in his own way. They made a big point about each person experiencing grief differently. There was another reference um, to something else. I, I, you know, if somebody said, quote, everyone's got to have their thing. I think that might've been Tilly who said that. So these two episodes kind of were complimentary and respecting the individual while understanding that we are all together. So beautifully, said. I, I really am impressed. I think it's um, really good writing and um, really good directing. I, wow. I uh, by Tune Day, just really, it's just a confident, hand on all levels you mm -hmm, know mm -hmm. writing directing acting production all of 100%, it agree, 100 yeah. agree. it was interesting watching on the ready room that they introduced that they're using this ar wall it's this giant circular wall with all these different screens and they were saying that that really helped with uh with the effects and you, you can see that there are a lot of rooms that the, the giant circular rooms like the in starfleet academy at right. the you know at the the place where saru was on kaminar it was these large rooms but I'm assuming that's what that's where the Baul were, for example, when we're seeing them sort of in those tanks outside there. That was probably projected onto the AR wall in some way. It's very cool. It must be so great for the actors. You know, yeah. you're not in front of a green screen. And I did watch that um, uh, that that show that showed the behind mm -hmm. the scenes a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, Doug was commenting. They went behind that that wall, and I was like, "Oh my god!" Like one little wire goes yeah. off you know like i was thinking the <laughs> ar guy probably has a stress level as high as uh air traffic controllers you know because i mean that is the coolest thing and makes it real for the actors and then tune day in that link you sent me was talking about how great it was for the director as well and um i've never worked with one i've heard about them mm -hmm. um you know, my husband was going to work with worked with one, one but I never personally have worked with one. Yeah, yeah, so that'd be very cool. So speaking of effects, there was that scene in episode two where they all got <laughs> suddenly pulled off. Yeah, the they ground. were all like, "Whoa!" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm assuming they they did it really smoothly. It like, really, smooth. I'm assuming. Yeah. I'm assuming that they were all on wires, but that is just an assumption on my part. I have mm -hmm. no way because I was watching and then they, you know, you remove the wires, but mm -hmm. they all, I don't know if the actors were just all instructed to like, they moved really balletically. Mm -hmm. Like they mm -hmm. didn't move like people uncomfortable in a mm -hmm. wire. And now that I think of it, I'd have to watch it again. But normally if you have a harness on, you can kind of see that the people people are bulkier and they didn't look bulkier. No, they, it looked really real. I don't know how they did that. Yeah. I, they might have done it with the computer. They might have, um, oh. you know, they take 3Ds of, of each actor and then they can move the actor in the scene. Oh. I mean, that would have been like so much computer work. I, I can't speak to how they did that, but they did it well, whatever really, they did. Very well, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was interesting to think what what scientifically was happening right there. It, it wouldn't just be the gravity went away. So the gravity went away, everybody would just still be sitting where they were. But then if they happened to launch themselves, they would go floating up. So I'm thinking yeah, what I'm thinking scientifically must have it. happened. There must have been some brief gravity inversion or something like that. that was, but that's that, what they said. They said that it was some. They they did address that in the yeah. show, and I don't know that I about yeah. it being a, a a very brief weird thing, and then it was the waves, and yeah. then Bryce yep. figured exactly. it all out and saved exactly. everything. You know. That was um, cool. <laughs> yeah, that was nice. Um, that was very cool. That Bryce figured that out. But 
it was nice yeah. seeing Bryce actually have, you know, significant uh, lines and role and stuff like that. Well, he had a Ronnie real, like, important, yeah, that he had a really important mm -hmm. key role in saving everyone. And that, and that is, you know, it's hard. It's so hard for the writers because there are leads in yeah. shows yeah. and that's the lead and yeah. that's who you watch and they're fantastic. And yeah. I, you know, once again, I'm, you know, Sonequa is just so good. And yeah. she's just so great in every, I just love her. Yeah. And Book is so good. They're all so good. They're doing, they, they just all are doing such a great job. And I love Still the new president of the Federation. Yeah. Uh, she's a, she's great. And um, just everybody's doing a good job. And, and we're seeing more of the crew. They mm -hmm. definitely are like, we know them now. And mm -hmm. we, we go to them and stay on them. And they have things but it, it's hard to incorporate whole storylines when you totally. only have what 45 minutes or something yeah, like totally, that. Yeah, totally. And it's, um, and it's true. Like, if you go back to the original series, I mean, there was never, as far as I remember, I don't remember a Chekhov centered episode of the original right, series. Right, or anything right, like right. That. So right, there's precedent right. for that. It's fine. <laughs> right. But, but, you know, they, you mentioned the at president. least they gave him that. Yeah, you mentioned the president. So that's an interesting one in that she's. Mm part Bajoran, part Cardassian, and I think a little bit of human mixed in there as well. That's a very interesting callback to say Deep Space Nine, where, you know, the Bajorans and Cardassians had just finished this big, you know, occupation, I guess, as they referred to it, right. of, of Bajor. <laughs> and there was one uh, uh, Bajoran Cardassian hybrid that we saw there, that was Zial, the, the daughter of Gul Dukat. But it's, right. it's interesting seeing now that they're, you know, well, I, I don't know, maybe maybe we shouldn't associate the individual with the the, the species, but it's interesting, interesting seeing that now, presumably those are together and part of the Federation. And just accepted, way. right. Yeah. And, and, and reaching and, high levels. I mean, yeah. to be the president of the entire Federation. Yeah. But um, yeah, she's a great addition. They did, It's really cool each year how they like, they introduced Book last year mm -hmm. and that was great addition. And then they introduced her this year and that's a great addition. They, they've introduced Blue, they yeah. introduced last Adira. year, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yep. So Adira and, you know, yeah, yeah it's yeah. nice. Yeah. Totally, totally. Um, I, I had another qu a production question for you. So um, I'm thinking about the scene at the beginning of episode two where they're all sitting in this big circle and there's like a projection going on. And there's all sorts of scenes where you're like, you know, looking at this angle as the president's talking to the um, Tarina, is that her name? I can't remember the president of the of Navarre. Of, of Navarre, yeah. Yeah, and, but it goes back and forth. And you see all these different people. There's so many different angles. And I'm thinking like, okay, is every one of those from a different take? And if, if there are different takes, do, do they go through the entire thing with that? look or do they just do that piece that's relevant and and the people behind them well each director i mean that takes a long time when yeah. you have that many people in yeah. a scene i mean in any whether it's star trek or you're around a big conference table in a law show or a medical mm -hmm. show you know when you've got the whole cast there plus plus some mm -hmm. you know it's it's going to be a big day i mean that's a day that a director looks at that scene and goes oh my god <laughs> you know and has to find ways <clears throat> to i mean you could see that several of those shots would have several people yeah. <clears throat> in the shot mm -hmm. you know they would he 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 layered it you know mm -hmm. you'd have the the close up in a profile and then you had several people in the back so you know he yeah. made it he made it very interesting shots and included several people so it wasn't just yeah it wasn't just master two. close up close up close up close up mm -hmm. but it was a lot of close ups it's just time and you know and you got to go around that circle and you got to take walls out and then put walls back in and it takes a long time i mean that you know what was I, I joke sometimes about what must go through a director and a assistant director's heads when they're um looking forward to that scene like well that's going to be a day you know yeah. or a half a day or whatever it took you know what's the record for you for the most number of times you had to repeat the same set of lines because they just need so many different angles you know what <laughs> i never think of it many yeah. i mean when you think of it like if you're in an ensemble show let's say there's 11 people in mm -hmm. in the ensemble and they're all at a conference table i mm -hmm. mean i think in chicago hope there were 11 and in private practice there were and so you're doing a master and you are doing all those close-ups. So you're there for a while. You run through the whole thing each time. So like you, you might have like a long yeah. close-up on you, but you're just like sitting there for yeah. most of it. And then in editing, they decide which part they'll use. But yeah, you have to go through the whole thing. Unless, I mean, unless you get a director, all directors are slightly editing in their head, but they okay. don't want to not give the producers the film in case the film... They don't want a producer to go to them and say, 
where's Jane's reaction to oh. Anthony's comment? Oh, I, I didn't shoot that. I, I edited it in my head and I thought I wouldn't, you know, they, it's better to just keep, have it all and not mm -hmm. use it. Mm -hmm. um, so the producers are the ones really... who decide in the end which shots go in, is that right? Sorry? Or is it the producers who decide in the end which shots go in? Yeah, I mean, the, um, the editor, the, so the editor will get all of the raw footage mm -hmm. <clears throat> and do an editor's cut in which he or she will really pretty much try to include every line in the script. I mean, try to show, make choices on which takes, but try to show the whole thing. That's a rough draft. And then I think this is the order. Then the director gets the editor's cut <clears throat> and makes a director's cut, you know, according to what they saw. And then that goes to the producers and then they make adjustments. And then that goes to the, studio and they send notes back and the producers make changes and then that goes to the network and then they might have no i mean there's a lot of people oh contributing i had, I had no idea it was that I, I never really thought about the post part to it like wow that's that's a ton well that's <laughs> a very interesting comment because i remember the first time an actor friend of mine directed mm -hmm. and um it was Von, actually vondi curtis hall i remember very well and he directed his first piece mm -hmm. And he started laughing because he said on the last day of shooting, he thought being new to it, yeah. I'm done. <laughs> and he said, I didn't realize the film begins to get made after the last day of shooting. And what wow. he meant is when you are assembling it and editing it, I mean, there's yeah. great stories of just genius editors putting, um, putting films together or changing the order of things and, and then, of course, you add the music and all that. But the editing, much of the art is also in the editing. Of totally. Course. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. totally. I guess that's where you get the director's cuts that people refer to and things like that, right? Oh, yeah. Sometimes you get and sometimes director's cuts, you know, are are better and interesting. And sometimes the director doesn't have as much enough distance. There's one mm. famous example of the director's cut not being as interesting as the producer's cut because the director was too much in love with every single thing he'd done. Oh. <laughs> and, um, and it was way longer and it was actually really, really good when it came out originally. There's some famous example of that. Uh, I can't remember what it is now. Yeah. That's, okay. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Sorry. It was kind of a very basic question. So I'm like, I have no idea what happens. <laughs> Editing is so hard. I mean, mm -hmm. I've tried to do a little bit like just editing interviews that mm -hmm. I've done of people and oh my God, I just have my hat goes off and this is just me trying to interview somebody talking, you know, like me trying to edit it and trying to make a decision of how do I cut this out and how do I, how do I tell the story? How do I keep the essence of the story while cutting out two thirds of it? And how do I, I mean, they're geniuses, how they do it. <laughs> That's epic. That's yeah. Epic. Yeah. Any, any final thoughts? I mean, I love these episodes. I, I just, I really, I'm just so happy to see how very, very good it is. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. I'm, and they, I just, they, how it gets better and better. That's not always the case. Mm -mm, Sometimes mm -mm. something is really good and very inspired at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then people say, why is the show not what it was in the beginning? Why mm -hmm. it's gotten worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. That is not the case here. I think no, it gets better and not. better and better. Like leap, 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 you know? Yeah. I love this, especially the opening of the intro. That was so funny. It was nice, this nice cold open, just boom. And, and well, tune, big yeah. misunderstanding. <laughs> yeah, Toon Day is really, really good yeah. at that classic action film tension and humor yeah you know right right together he's yep. really good at that he did that in that episode last year where um where Sonequa was going through remember Sonequa got high and oh yeah there was, was all the, this that was tension the pilot last year or the, uh, that was the, a pilot last yeah yeah or i mean Toon Day pilot, did yeah. that one too and yeah. there was like great tension and danger but yeah. funny it's like that i don't know if it's from die hard there <laughs> just that funny um humor that yeah. comes in at moments of tension yeah agreed yeah. Well, lovely getting to chat with you about those well, things again. Really so fun. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you. And thanks for asking me to do this again. Well, oh, it's really pleasure. fun. Thank you for being willing. <laughs> I learned a lot this time. Thank you so much. I learned, I learned a lot every time. <laughs> as, as do I. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to look for butterfly people now in my backyard. <laughs>
All right, everybody, tune in next time. Okay. And thank tune you in for, next time. Thank you for seeing Biotrecky with the Admiral. Bye. Bye.